And so being explicit with our clients that these are risks of bipolar disorder and that if these risks come up, we cannot care for them anymore. But also saying, I respect your decision, even if it is not the decision that the obstetric community or the psychiatric community would recommend. Hi, my name is Augustine Colebrook, and I'm the principal at Midwifery Wisdom Collective. I speak on this podcast about big picture, political issues, and the future of our profession. Hey, y'all. I am Jamara, and I'm a midwife. I'm also a birth justice activist. And this season, I am looking forward to sharing stories of Black midwives and the communities they serve. Hello, beloved birth community. I'm Angela Love, nurse midwife since 2004, preceptor and mother. I have a home birth practice called Midwife Love and a national telehealth practice called Midwife RX. My mission is to keep birth choices available and to educate the next generation of midwives for our daughters and grandchildren. Matriarchy now. I'm Layla Wyatt. I get to share with you the voices of student midwives from across the country and beyond. This season, we focus on those students who just graduated, are about to sit for the NARM, or did yesterday, and we get tips and tricks for you for what happens at the end of the student midwife journey. Well, welcome back to the Midwifery Wisdom Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, we're glad to have you. I am so excited to introduce my next guest. And as I actually prefer is like not to introduce, but like to ask you to introduce because, I, you know, I would do a worse job than you. So tell us, who are you? Where are you? What are you about? Um, hi, my name is Morley Adams. I am a recently graduated midwife. I live in Seattle, Washington. Um, and I'm here to chat about perinatal bipolar disorder today. Mm, it's so such an important topic. And you have done a master's level thesis on this work. So first of all, I want to really welcome you because we have the same alma mater. Um, you just graduated from Bastier. Congrats. Thank you. And did you do the MS or the MA program? Um, I did the MS program. Awesome. I did the MA. Well, congratulations on graduating. And let's kind of dive deeper into your topic. So first of all, for folks who don't know, what is perinatal mood disorder? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's many different types, but really it is any sort of mental illness or mood disorder or something along those lines that affects someone anytime in their pregnancy or in the postpartum period. And for some people, it's limited to that perinatal time. And for others, it's chronic and um, was pre-existing or continues past that time. And what are some of the main pain points that you have noticed in your research around this topic? Like, why is it such an important topic? Sure. I mean, for one thing, it's not really addressed very well, and we're seeing really big um, adverse outcomes related to it. For example, um, the way that people bond with their babies as they grow up, or even like um, health outcomes related to the pregnancy in general. For example, bipolar disorder has higher associations with things like cesarean birth and hypertensive disorders in pregnancy. Yeah. And it's a particular issue in the community-based birth circles because in general, there have been, there's been no conversation, no, uh, very little referrals. Um, and so what I was really taken with, and one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the podcast is to help educate community-based midwives about this newer research that you have. So um, without putting you too much on the spot, um, one of the things you did that was so compelling in your um, defense, in your thesis presentation, is you gave case studies and uh, really kind of made it like palatable and like walked the viewer through what would happen in a community-based setting. So I'm wondering, do you have one of those handy? Would you be willing to um, kind of give an example of where this could come up in a community-based midwife's practice, what they would see and and how it could be handled differently than it is currently. 
Sure, yeah. Um, why don't we go through this one? It is on the shorter side, and I think it's a lot more pertinent than the one I went over in my, well, not pertinent, but a lot more likely that midwives will encounter this. Postpartum psychosis, which was the one I went over in my um, presentation, only happens in about two per 1,000 people. Um, this next one is quite a bit more common to encounter. So um, yeah, why don't we just go through it? I'll jump in. So um, this case study is about someone named Bianca. Of course, this is not a real name. Um, this is a 36-year-old G4P0, and it's a planned IVF-conceived pregnancy. She's married to her husband, DeAndre, and she transfers into community midwifery care at around 16 weeks gestation. Um, really uncomplicated medical history, no family history of mood disorders, but she does tell you that she's been depressed on and off since high school. Um, has a good support system and is currently doing emotionally well when she comes to care. Um, you are a midwife who decides to conduct prenatal um, EPDS, Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Screenings for all your clients. And she scores a five on that, which is not a positive score for depression. So everything looks good. You welcome her into your care and congratulate her on her pregnancy. Um, so her care moves along pretty smoothly until 26 weeks when she messages you to let you know that she's struggling with feeling depressed. So you give her a call to chat about it and she says, oh, well, it's just normal sadness. I'm used to it. It comes and goes. I manage fine and I just feel more tired than usual and bummed throughout the day. It's not a big deal. Um, so you bring up the options of therapy and psychiatry and um, even the option to start medication if she wants. And she lets you know she'd like to avoid medication for now because she can quote unquote handle it, but we'll look into therapists. So you provide her some recommendations and advise her to call back if things continue to get worse. So you see her a couple weeks later and she tells you she's still struggling emotionally. Um, it's been pretty tough for her and she feels like her partner is getting moody when she's feeling down, which is making things worse and things really aren't moving in the right direction, but she still feels like she can manage. Um, you ask her if she found a therapist and she says she did, but that they can't meet with her for another month. Um, she still doesn't want to get psychiatric care despite your recommendation. And she says, if it gets any worse, I'll reconsider. Um, which is something really common we run into right now is just that it takes forever to get someone into um, mental health care if they need it. So she calls you back a week later and says, I promised I'd call if it got worse and it did. And I haven't felt this bad in a really long time. I think I'm ready to see a psychiatrist. I feel embarrassed about it, but I'm starting to feel desperate. It's really hard to function right now. I hardly have an appetite and I have no motivation to exercise anymore. I'm starting to worry that I'm not taking good enough care of myself to raise a healthy baby. So you reassure her that a few weeks of decreased exercise likely won't be harmful to her baby and spend a few minutes chatting about nutrition and ways to get her to eat and send some referrals for psychiatric care and also recommend a support group for parents struggling with perinatal depression. Like always, she promises to reach out if things get worse. So you see her a few weeks later for a 32 week visit and she's clearly doing much better her husband expresses what a night and day change it has been and how thankful he is that she's not so depressed. And she tells you, I got really lucky and the first psychiatrist I reached out to was able to fit me in that day. We chatted for a while, they diagnosed me with depression and they wrote me a prescription for some antidepressants. I can tell that they've started working because I'm feeling better than ever. I feel so energetic and motivated and I've been able to catch up on everything I let slip through the cracks while I was feeling depressed. It's like, I'm a whole new woman. I never want this feeling to go away. You tell her how glad you are that she's feeling better, but take a moment to let her know that she still is at risk for postpartum depression. She expresses understanding, but seems to shrug, shrug it off. So she returns to your office again two weeks later, and you're surprised to see that her husband isn't with her because he hasn't missed a single prenatal visit so far. When you ask why um, he couldn't make it, she says, well, we kind of got into an argument. We've been together for 12 years, married for eight, and for 10 of those years at least, we've been together. He's been suggesting on and off that we try an open relationship just to mix things up sometimes. 
I kept saying no, I just couldn't ever imagine myself being with someone else. Um, but ever since I started feeling better and took the antidepressants, my libido has been so high, like really, really high. He's often too busy or tired, so I suggested to him what he'd been suggesting to me for years. He got so mad and told me how inappropriate it was to say that now that we're having a child. And that was last night, and he hasn't spoken to me since. It's whatever. I know he'll get over it, and I don't see the issue anyways. It sounds like fun in an exciting, almost risky type of way. I don't see what's wrong with some excitement. You're surprised at how upbeat and giggly she is, despite this argument she's been having. During your visit that day, you also notice that she's much chattier and more energetic than usual. She mentions that she's not sleeping very well, but isn't really missing it either. You feel a little funny about this picture and ask Bianca if it would be okay if you chatted with her psychiatric prescriber. So she agrees and signs a release of information, but tells you it's not necessary because she's feeling perfectly amazing. So with her consent, you do call her a psychiatrist and mention what you've noticed. And the psychiatrist mentions the possibility of something called a hypomanic episode and thus her actually having bipolar disorder. But they state it's more likely that it's a combination of pregnancy hormones and her medication doing its job. He says, my wife had a higher libido when she was pregnant too and laughs. You feel a little disregarded and like you've heard a little too much information, but think no more of the conversation. So her husband, DeAndre, calls you the following week and he said, hey, I just wanted to let you know that Bianca's acting kind of crazy right now. I'm pretty annoyed and fed up with her, but it's weird enough that I thought to call you. He goes on to explain that Bianca is hardly sleeping, continues to have an extremely high libido and finds everything to be comical. He also tells you that she never slows down and is incredibly active from the moment she wakes up from the, to the moment she goes to bed. And I barely understand what she's saying anymore because she talks so freaking fast, he says. You thank him for the call and decide to call her psychiatrist again, promising DeAndre you'll call him right back. So you're unable to speak with her main psychiatrist because he's on vacation, but speak with his colleague and explain the situation. And that psychiatrist tells you, yeah, this does sound like a hypomanic episode. And it was probably induced by those antidepressants. She tells you that Bianca needs to stop taking her antidepressants and come see her for medication that will treat the highs and the lows. She tells you that she can see her the following day and asks you to administer a PMQ screen in the meantime. PMQ is patient mania questionnaire. So you call DeAndre back and relay the information. And when you mention bipolar disorder, he is shocked and concerned. You ask to speak with Bianca, whose speech is even more rapid and upbeat than you remember it to have been a week ago. She's reluctant to accept the possibility of having bipolar disorder. She does agree to fill out the PMQ over the phone with you, and it is a clear, positive screen. She's still not very concerned, but does agree to see um, the psychiatrist in the morning. The following day, you speak with the psychiatrist, and they let you know that Bianca was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and they were able to adjust her medication accordingly. Um, Bianca should be acting more normally soon, and they prescribed her something to help her sleep tonight. Over the next couple of weeks, her mood stabilizes, and she's incredibly embarrassed about some of the ways she behaved, reflecting on how irrational and unlike her it seems in retrospect. Fortunately, she's able to get in with a counselor who helps her process these emotions. DeAndre and Bianca both join online support groups for partners of those with bipolar disorder and people with bipolar disorder in the perinatal period, respectively. She delivers a healthy baby boy at your birth center at 41 weeks and four days, and with you, her therapist, psychiatrist, and the rest of her support team, she remains stable throughout the postpartum period. Her medications work well for her, and she comes to terms with her diagnosis, making amends as needed. So the lesson of this case is that treating a depressive bipolar episode with antidepressant monotherapy can incite a manic or hypomanic episode, which can easily be prevented by screening for both depression and bipolar disorder. Mm, it's so impactful. And I just, I just love the way that you've written these case studies because it allows the midwife to see herself in that scenario. And I think that's what's so important and so powerful. In the midwifery circles, um, there's kind of this unspoken belief that, you know, that, that first of all, in American society in general, there's this kind of unspoken belief that like you can just think your way out of depression or like you're depressed or you're anxious because you don't have the right support 
right? Um, and, and so there's this belief in this sort of unspoken belief in, in community-based midwifery that um, this if we just love her more, like it will go away, right? I, I don't know if you encountered this in your conversations with midwives, but there's kind of an egoism or like a belief that like we do it so much better than the hospital that we can't possibly have people that need pharmaceuticals in our care, right? I mean, I'm sort of exaggerating, but I see this in the chat rooms and in the conversations with midwives a lot. And so I really wanted you to make it real. And you made it so real with that. Um, and I, I had a few questions as follow-up. So first of all, um, there are, I'm sure midwives are aware of some of the screening tools out there. So you mentioned the PMQ, um, certainly the Edinburgh uh, has been used. Tell us about the screening tools and what do you recommend that midwives implement into their practice and why? Yes, I'm so glad you asked this because I love talking about this and I seriously have a recommendation that I wish everyone would use. I do think um, <clears throat> using that EPDS, the depression screening tool is really vital and I think we should be offering it prenatally and postpartum but we need to be offering it concordantly with a um, bipolar screening tool because um, a bipolar depressive episode and a just general depression episode look the same. We can't tell the difference unless we're screening for a history or current manic or hypomanic symptoms. Um, so that being said, if someone does not have a history of bipolar disorder, I would recommend the MDQ, the mood disorder questionnaire, which is a lifetime screen. So that's assessing symptoms they've had in their life. The PMQ is great for someone who's already diagnosed or who is symptomatic because it's a right now screen. It's assessing how someone feels right now, just like the EPDS does. Okay, awesome. And we'll put links to those um, in the show notes so that people can grab those. Um, okay, so uh, let's kind of shift gears for a quick second, and um, let's talk to the midwife who, who follows your recommendations and implements these into her practice, and she's doing a general uh, MDQ when they enter care, and she's doing um, a PMQ when if there's symptoms. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. your general recommendation. And she, she finds someone who screens positive, like you just gave the example. What does she do next? Like one of the important things I have always held true is that you need a robust community referral database so that you know who to call when. How does someone develop that? Like there are a lot of new midwives in the world. You're one of the new midwives. How do you, if you haven't been familiar with this, um, this mental health world, like if you've been one of those mental health deniers, you know, and you think, how do I develop my referral base? Who do I call? How do you address that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was actually something I looked at in my thesis is how do we connect people with these resources, especially for people who are working in more rural communities. It's a really huge barrier to getting good care. Um, and as someone living in the city and caring for people who live in this area, we have the privilege of lots of good local providers, but I acknowledge not everyone has that. Um, so if you're in Washington, Perinatal Support Washington has an amazing database of providers. They have something called a warm line as well that clients can um, call if they're having concerns about their own mental health and it's for partners too. Um, and Perinatal Support Washington is through Postpartum Support International. So that should have um, resources for people across the states. I frankly haven't looked into it enough to know how good it is for international resources, although given the title, hopefully it's okay. Um, and then also I like MCPAP for Moms, which is I think a Massachusetts-based organization, and they also have some great resources. The nice thing about um, the modern time is that we have telehealth, and so people do have access to care if they have access to a computer. That's amazing. And hopefully you can send us those links. We can put those in the show notes as well. So what is the, uh, the general, like, do they just start calling therapists and be like, do you help perinatal mood disorders or like, how would they connect in their local community? Mm -hmm. 
Well, ideally the midwife would have a list of perinatal therapists that they like. I have one of local perinatal therapists that I will refer to clients who need them. And frankly, it's kind of a sucky situation because most of the time they're like, we're booked for three months. We can put you on our wait list. So it's like, do we have this person wait for care, especially if they really need it? Or do we have them start reaching out to providers who do not specialize in the perinatal period, knowing that they might provide good care, but maybe not the best care for this person? Um, yeah. So as midwives, yeah. we could always try a warm handoff, trying to give a call to offices, using our provider voice and our provider hats to see if we can snag them a spot. But to be honest, times are pretty tough right now in the mental health world and everyone is needing mental health care. So it's really, really difficult to get people in. And it's just kind of a shitty situation that we've ended up stuck in. Yeah. Well, one uh, resource for therapy, at least in the perinatal period, is uh, my guest from a couple episodes ago, um, uh, Dancy Perinatal Services is um, a national organization. I think they're operating in um, about a third of the states right now with a plan to expand further. And they do telehealth medicine and local medicine, uh, mental health care for folks who are struggling in the perinatal period. So that's one resource, but certainly we'll link any others that we can resource. Um, how about um, uh, perinatal, uh, what is it called? PM, the, the international organization, PM, oh, PBI. Yeah, PSI. What about them? Yeah, I know they have databases on their website. They definitely have a lot of support group options, most of which meet online, which I think is really awesome. They have like so many like survivors of postpartum psychosis, uh, partners of people who've had postpartum psychosis, people with bipolar disorder, people with depression. It's really amazing. So having that community support is great. And I do believe Yes, they have a page for professionals with a provider directory so you can find providers near you who practice some court, some sort of perinatal mental health care. So it's it's pretty convenient. I don't know if it's as extensive as it could be if every local provider is on there, but it's definitely like a place to start. Awesome. Okay, well, we'll list all those in the show notes. So what is the prevalence? Like a midwife might be listening to this and be like, okay, I'm ready, but like, should I expect to ever see someone with a perinatal mood disorder? What's the prevalence in our population? Yeah, it is about 4.4%. So common, it's common. A lot of people have bipolar disorder. You're at the grocery store and you're walking by someone with bipolar disorder. We are absolutely seeing it in our clients. There are many midwives who have caseloads of 60 to 100 or even more people at a time in larger practices. They've got clients with bipolar disorder, whether they know it or not. Yeah. And the big point here is we can know it if we do just do more appropriate screening, right? Yes. It's so, it's so easy. It's like a three minute little screening tool and we could have so much more information and provide better care. And that's what midwives are all about. So we should be doing it. Definitely, definitely. <clears throat> okay, um, I want to move into more of like um, like a broader conversation now, if you're willing. Um, so for years in my defensive charting class um, and just in, in midwifery consulting and counseling in general, I've been talking about using the uh, charting uh, phrase and terminology called alert and oriented times three or four. So this A and O times three or four. And this is um, a a mainstream uh, midwifery, uh, not midwifery focus, but a mainstream medical uh, assessment, which allows the provider to do um, an objective assessment of their um, alertness and their orientation to person, place, time, which all of our clients should definitely be. And then the really important one is situation. And I think this is a really useful tool in um, prenatals, in uh, screening to accept them to care, um, in uh, the the preparing for birth phase, and and in postpartum as well. So um, are are you familiar with this terminology? Um, Were you trained to use this? Um, What what do you think about using this, this subjective kind of assessment? Honestly, I had not heard much about it, but I think it 
could make a lot of sense and be really useful in that context of mental health care. I think it's really important. And one of the reasons I teach it, and my, my attention has not been mental health, and that's one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to you, but my attention has been on trying to help midwives screen for clients that are actually not appropriate for midwifery care psychologically spiritually, mm. environmentally, um, familially, right? So this is this is kind of how I use it. So the way A and O works, and it's a very simple um, assessment, a judgment call of the provider, essentially. It's a way to formulate the instinct, the red flag, the gut feeling that we have as midwives. And it's used in the O section of charting. So subjective, everything they tell you, objective, everything that you assess. So it's in the O section. And the shorthand is A and O times four. And that means that this person is alert and oriented to who they are, where they are, when they are, and what they are choosing. And this last one is what's so important. Obviously, if you have someone who's in such a state that they don't know who and where and when they are, we have a bigger problem, right? And so that that is generally pretty darn obvious. I, I mean, as a provider, you have someone walk in who can't identify that. That's a problem. But the one that is oftentimes missed is this fourth, this oriented to situation. And um, sometimes, like I give an example, like one time I had a gal, she came and sat on my couch and she was like, I'm so excited. I'm so glad I found you. And so I usually have this question like, so what made you choose midwifery care? You know, what are you hoping for? Kind of eliciting more information. And she says, I've always wanted a water birth. Like I want a water birth. Like I love the videos. I've seen them. I watch them. They're amazing. I'm not sure if I want an epidural, but I definitely want a water birth. And I'm like, ah, we're missing a really important piece here, right? She's not oriented to the decision that she's making. She doesn't actually know what midwifery care is because you have to know that you cannot have an epidural and a water breath at the same time. Like that's a really major mismatch. That's a pretty obvious example, but there are lots of other examples where a client is trying to enter care or into their, their second orientation history taking visit and you find a total mismatch. They don't understand what they are choosing. And if this is at eight weeks, you can recommend books and videos and classes, and you can have time to orient them. But for instance, if you're taking a late transfer at 37 weeks, at 34 weeks, who's not oriented to what they're choosing, they're not going to have a generally a safe outcome. And when I talk about safety in midwifery care, I'm talking about safety for the baby, safety for the birther, and safety for the midwife. And if they don't know what they're choosing, they put you at risk right? Because one of the hallmarks of midwifery care is that they're leading the care decisions, right? So when it comes to mental health, this is one of those pieces where a person who is um, having a manic episode or having a depressive episode, they oftentimes are not oriented to the decision that they're making. And so we don't always have the skill to identify someone who has, uh, who's having, a, you know, a, some kind of a manic episode. We don't always have the skill to say this person has bipolar, right? And I don't think midwives should necessarily be in the place of diagnosing those situations. I'm sure, sure. you agree, yeah. right? But what we do have the skill to do is to look at this person and compare them to our general population, not, you know, U.S. general population, but midwifery general population and say, this person doesn't really get it. I'm having to repeat myself. I'm having to say things that I think should be obvious or are common knowledge. It's not common knowledge for this person. Therefore, they're not oriented to situation. They don't know what they're choosing. How do you feel about that being used in the charting and in the assessment place where the midwife can actually create a way to verbalize her intuition or her felt sense? Yeah, yeah, that's really... Um... That makes a lot of sense to me, actually. I like that idea a lot. Really, one of the main things that comes up for me is just that when someone is manic or hypomanic, like you said, it's often hard to tell and people often don't complain about it because they feel fine. They yeah. have not they feel good, control. actually. Yeah, yeah, right. feel good. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, so um, like you said, 4% of the population or more, we're definitely, you know, catching these folks in our, in our practices at some point. And if we provide care long enough to enough people, we'll definitely catch this. Um, and um, 
given those statistics, probably uh, most midwives in their first three years of practice will run into somebody given oh. that they might do a hundred births, you know, in three years that they're definitely going to run into that. Mm-hmm. So um, a depressive episode or a depressive affect is, is I would say fairly recognizable. Wouldn't you? Sure. If someone's exhibiting it outwardly, I feel like we've all had the person who's like happy, bubbly, wonderful person. You get their EPDS and it's like 16 and you're like, what's going on? But for the most part, I would totally agree when people are depressed, we're able to pick up on it. Yeah. It's kind of a depressive affect, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Their tone might be lower. Their eye contact might be less. Their body language might be less animated, right? So a depressive affect is fairly easy to see. Certainly Mm -hmm. some people mask and we, and they hide that depressive feeling with their outwardly appearing bubbly personality, like you said, but most of the time a depressive affect is fairly easy to visualize. Uh, a manic or a hypomanic a- uh, affect is, is I think, harder to identify because the predominant masking of our culture is outright and bubbly and all that sort of thing. So tell us um, something that a midwife might be uh, looking for. What, what are some kind of like yellow flags, like you should look further into this? Right. Um, I think one would just be like speech. Like if you're noticing someone's speech is more rapid or even like slurring together, especially when mm. it's not at all how they spoke before, that mm. could be a sign that something's off. Um, I know many midwives will ask clients about how they're sleeping. And as we know, insomnia and difficulty sleeping can come with pregnancy, but it's also a really common marker of mania or hypomania is inability to sleep, but not feeling tired, not missing it. So if your client's like, I've been sleeping two or three hours a night for the past two weeks, but I feel great. And I've been deep cleaning my house and my birth bag's already packed and I've done a hundred million other things that would also be concerning that their energy levels are super high, but they're not sleeping. Mm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Hmm. <clears throat> it's such a complex issue, isn't it? Like I, I just imagine mm-hmm. cause it's so elusive, you know, like, especially in community-based midwifery, like we want to meet someone right where they are and we want to hold them as a whole human, right. You know, however they uh, identify, like we're trying to really, um, create a safe space for people to be themselves. Um, and then this, this piece of having a, um, a, a a brain chemical dysregulation, right. Or a, um, some kind of, uh, mood affect that changes their behavior, uh, changes their thinking, changes everything about them. Um, like you said, that definitely needs identification and treatment. And it's such a funny place to walk as you've dug into this research for gosh, three years now, right? Like you've been, or at least two years, you've been working on your thesis. Um, what has, um, what have you learned or what would you like to share with midwives who are struck on that, that balance of trying to like, not, uh, hyper fixate or, or think about, you know, changing someone or does this person need meds or an evaluation versus the one that's like, so like everything will be fine. People work itself out, you know, like where where do you find the balance between kind of hyper-focused on this and really hands-off on this? Yeah. I mean, just like we let our clients lead their midwifery care, we can also let them lead their midwifery care in the context of mental health. Um, Obviously presenting the options to them and giving them a full, like, informed choice, you know, these are your risks on medication versus off of them, just as far as episode relapse goes, and what are the consequences of an episode in pregnancy, and here are the risks of bipolar disorder, but it is your right to choose to medicate or not medicate, or to seek counseling or not, with the caveat that we as the care providers, if the situation is no longer safe, have to send you elsewhere because if someone is having a psychotic episode, they are not safe for midwifery care. If someone is um, severely suicidal or planning to self-harm or planning to commit suicide or um, being infanticidal, these are all things that are no longer appropriate for us. And so being explicit with our clients that these are risks of bipolar disorder and that if these risks come up, we cannot care for them anymore. We're also saying, I respect your decision, even if it is not the decision that the obstetric community or the psychiatric community would recommend. 
Mm, it's so powerful. It's such a line to walk. Um, <clears throat> So let's talk about this bridge building between the mainstream medical world and the community-based midwifery world. And in Washington State, where I think you are and are planning to practice, it's one of the healthiest, most integrative parts of the country. Um, and there are many parts of the country where midwifery is still not even recognized um, or is even uh, criminalized in some way. Um, how, how do we go about um, you know, evaluating our own risk status, uh, supporting folks who fall into this category. How do we go about um, navigating this in a, in, a, in a less integrated center? Right, absolutely. I mean, we have to consider really just what our scope of practice in that state is. And already, as a midwife talking about mental health care and providing informed consents on medication that we're not prescribing, but making sure people have the full picture could technically be a line that you're towing. Um, so really, it's it has to be individual and in looking at what does your state say a midwife can or can't do, and what are the consequences associated with doing something that's either ambiguous or that your state says you should not be doing, whether that is a just decision or not. It, yeah. It's really difficult. It is really difficult. I think the, the main point that I'm hearing from you is about the importance of layers of support, mm -hmm. right? So um, we are just one of the layers of support that someone in a mental health crisis needs. In the same way that someone who's having a physical health crisis would need layers of support. It's, it's the same way for mental health. And so um, I loved your case study, referring back to that, talking about how they had, you know, their, their psychotherapist who was prescribing, they had their counselor who was helping them process the emotions. They had you as their provider, maybe, you know, family and other folks. Um, certainly the hospital is a backup layer of support in all of our care plans um, and really just kind of driving home that we are part of a team. And so if you're in a less integrative state like Washington is, um, building that for yourself, making those connections in your community. One thing that I've done to try to build that uh, layer of support in, in my practices before is I have on my company letterhead written letters to um, folks that I've researched on the internet. And I think when you get a hand typed or handwritten, hand signed letter, something tangible, it's a lot more real than an email. You can kind of disregard an email. A lot of spam comes in email. But um, if you hand address an envelope, everyone basically opens that. So it's a great way to get in front of someone. So um, read some of the, the Yelp reviews of counselors in your area, uh, find their address, address a letter and actually send them a letter. And it can be a bit of a form letter. You know, you don't have to write it individually for every person, but it can be like, dear so-and-so, I'm a provider in the community. I've heard about you. I'd like to make a formal connection and be able to refer folks to you. Are you available to have lunch? Uh, could we could we have tea? Like, how, how can we connect? And that little um, kind of, Olive Branch, that little connection, uh, sometimes it's ignored, but most of the time, especially if you pick folks who aren't in a big uh, institution that are working for themselves, we usually respond to that in the same way that you would if a doula reaches out and say, hey, I'm practicing in your area, I'd love to meet you for lunch. Most of us say, sure, I'd love to meet you too, right? It's that bridge building. And then you build that personal connection so that when you call with an emergency, they're so much more likely to be receptive. They're so much more likely to take your call if you have a client who needs kind of urgent assessment. Um, and I just recommend all midwives do that with with uh, all providers uh, that you'd like to have a deeper connection with, um, you know, take them out to lunch, take them out for a coffee, uh, drop by their office with a fruit basket, you know? <laughs> like something that says, you like, I care about what you're doing in the community and I want to know more about you. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah Alrighty. So I would love to know what the outcome of this thesis is for you. You have created something spectacular. Tell us more. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to put this to use. I would really like to see um, better education and practice in the midwifery community about perinatal um, bipolar disorder. And so my goal is to actually apply this curriculum for continuing education units and teach it to midwives and give midwives the handouts that I made and 
the resources and I have kind of um, a template or an outline for a plan for if someone does have an episode that you should establish with your clients prenatally. And I think all these really cool tools and resources that I would love to share with people. Well, I don't know if we have, I probably should have asked you this privately, but we would, Midwifery Wisdom would love to help you launch that into the world. And I don't know if you're, if you already have a plan, but if you need any help in getting your course out, we would love to help you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I will um, reach out when I have some more details. Yeah, it would be um, so needed and so necessary. And as I'm sure you discovered when you were doing the research, there's so few people doing this work. There's really so little education for midwives in mental health. And I just love what you've done. Your focus has been on um, perinatal bipolar disorder, correct? Yes. Um, but through doing that, you got to exposure to a lot of other mental health issues, correct? Yeah, I was um, yeah. And so, uh, you know, this comprehensive evaluation of our clients and those red flags or those yellow flags of knowing when to refer or when to uh, evaluate or when to um, really take a deeper dive is so important. And there's so few people doing it. I really hope this becomes a standalone course that people can take. I really hope that we can get you out in front of more folks so that they can hear what you've done and, and uh, educate themselves. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Marley, it's been such a pleasure. I am so excited to share this with the world. So excited for your career. Congratulations as a new midwife out there in the world. Do you have plans? What are your plans after graduation? You just graduated this last week. And now what yeah. are you going to do? I am currently assisting some local midwife practices until I have enough numbers to get my Washington state license. So if you're a Washington midwife, I'm looking for a job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I love that. And uh, there's really a possibility. Washington has a lot of midwifery practices and birth centers and they're, they're really, I'm sure there'll be a place for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thanks for sharing your wisdom with us today. And uh, we'll, we'll be looking forward to seeing the next great things that you do. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me.